All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome once again as we gather together. Thank you for coming, and uh, if you're joining us online, there is no one online, so uh, you're not joining us. Uh, but for the rest of us who are here, thanks for taking time. First off, the tragic news, I'm glad you are sitting. As of today, the uh, owner of 10-4 is ill and has not been able to find a manager. So there may be no 10-4 this summer. <coughs> So it is a yes. So if anybody of you want to manage the 10 floor, it's it. So if you'd like a part time job or a full, a full time community job managing the 10 floor, we'd appreciate. But it's just rumor right now in town. So we'll leave it in the rumor mill. But oh my. Oh my. Yeah, they should at least be looking for staff right now. Well, usually it's open. Is it open in April? Oh, yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Oh. Wall Air will have to open an ice cream stand. Oh. All right, that's fair. So, Sylvia will do it. Sylvia is going to take up the job. All right. <laughs> All right, grab a coffee and come join us. She wants, Anna wants a coffee? Yeah. All right, we are actually coming, <laughs> I'm not sure which table is worse, the older people or the children. <laughs> frontal lobe, uh, frontal lobe atrophy over at this table here. <laughs> No, she's. If you put, if you brought Diana over here, it would just drop you down statistically. But it'd be like a bell curve. <laughs> I want you to start thinking about uh, two questions. One is when do you want to wrap up Bible study for summer. Secondly, we are that quickly approaching the end of Romans. Here on in, it it moves fairly quickly with uh, some pretty basic instructions, and uh, there's not a lot of. I don't think my study contributes a lot of your under, to your understanding because it's so straightforward. Uh, so where would you like to head to after Romans? One of the beauties of Bible study is we can tackle some of the longer books and you know, we, time is on our side. And so you know, if we only get a few verses done on a Wednesday, we're not under a constraint like Sunday morning. So I do really try to keep it an hour, but it does allow us some latitude. So if you want to pick up a book of the New Testament or if there's something of substance in the Old Testament you want to tackle, or if there's a, maybe a theological theme, you know, the door is really open to you. Um, as far as what you want to go. So kind of put that in your mix master and make some bread with that. That's we a, had taken like a little survey at one point. Was that for Sunday school? Or that, that was for Sunday school, yeah. And that's why we're doing Revelation now for Sunday school. Yeah, that's what I was saying, but that's Sunday school. Oh, we could do hell here. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly what I was saying. That's a, but I wasn't sure yeah, that's, that's an odd phrasing. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of an odd phrasing, but uh, we could certainly do that. Yeah, okay, that's... Hades, Sheol, the place of the dead. We could do the afterlife, both heaven and Hades, and see what scripture says. That's more of a topical theme, but if that fits in your wheel. My wheel horse. Your wheel horse. We'll, uh, we'll go from there. All right. We're at uh, chapter 13 and 14 today. I'm not, we're just wrapping up 13, and if we have time, we'll move into 14. 14 and 15 are one long section. Last week, we looked at our civic duty, our responsibility to the government. And what is the... Oh, sorry, Harlan. 
No, no, it's there. It's 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 Bonnie's fault. She was supposed to hand them out. So she had one job. Yeah. One job. What is the overarching theme or, or overarching teaching of our relationship to the state? Subject. To be subject to the state. But we also saw, and as Revelation is a prime example, there are times when that subjugation is not required of us. So that was kind of the other. So we pick up with this theme of owing. Paul says, owe to whom is owed. Owe, co- uh, owe uh, respect to whom is owed respect. Owe trust, owe taxes. So he, he has this word in his mind going, owing. And then he says, and while we're on the subject of owing, let's pick up 13 verses 8 through 10. We will start with Shelley Eckstein. Could you read verse 13, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10? What does that sound like? Is there another passage that sounds like? It does. It sounds like 1 Corinthians 13. You know, love is the patient, love is kind, love is... And Paul says, in 10 especially, love does not wrong a neighbor, therefore... So what if we owe the state subjugation in the right season and honor to whom honor is due, taxes to whom... What do we owe each other? Love. Which is easier to fulfill? <laughs> Paying your taxes or loving your neighbor? Taxes. <laughs> Therein lies the tension. Um, why, okay, let's presuppose that loving, uh, that paying your taxes is easier than loving your neighbor. We'll get back to that, Sylvia. Um, why is it? substantially easier to pay your tax, which is a number on a page, than to love your neighbor. What's that, Zach? Yeah, you just, you just do it, right? Yeah, it's a number, you pay it, you're done. There's no, is there, I mean, there might be an emotional response to paying your taxes. We'll, we'll go over that. But it's so black and white, right? You pay your taxes. Where, what does loving your neighbor entail? Action, yeah, and uncertainty, and when, and what if I don't like them, and I know them, and they've, you know, they've sprayed on my property, or they're, you know, they they drove over my dog at some point in history. There's all kinds of stories. So this is actually the more difficult of the two. What, why should we love our neighbor? If we default on taxes, or What's that, Harlan? You can default on taxes. Get there. That's right, they will. But what if you default on love? See? They'll come get you too, right? <laughs> Who will come get you if you default on love? Yeah, God does. That's where the owing is good. Um, so this verse is all about priority of loving one another, as loving one another as covenant brothers and sisters, but also as fellow human beings. O is interesting. It can mean a sense of debt. Uh, it can mean a sense of responsibility. And Paul seems to combine the two. It is a debt we owe. Why do we owe love to each other? Because God, God loved us, therefore we should love it. And it's also our responsibility to one another. All right. Except to love one of this is the whole key of this chapter. This matter of fact is one of the great key thoughts of the New Testament and of the Old Testament. That is, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, absolutely. The term neighbor is literally another of a different kind, which means not your sister or brother or cousin. Your neighbor is someone who's of a different kind than you. So it's easier, well, sometimes it's not easier to love your brother or sister, but for the most part it should be. Um, it is a little bit different here. So this is the widest possible terms. Um, one interesting little side note, it's not unusual for Paul to use uh, the Old Covenant in his context of preaching to the New Covenant. He really likes the Old Covenant. And what we see throughout Paul is, Paul, uh, there's an old phrase, I milk many cows, but I make my own butter. In other words, most of us glean ideas from 20 different places, right? Someone says, if you want to see art, go to a hardware store. If you want to learn history, go to a museum. Like, you know, you, everywhere you go, if you go to a hardware store, you can see modern art, packaging, design, lighting. It's a form of 
art, right? But if you want to know history, you know, and culture, so you, you can learn from many, many different places. What is the strangest or what is an odd place where you learned something that you reapplied it somewhere else? Can you think of a place? I learned that over here, but it sure worked over there. Can you think of a spot? Is that wrong? You get a ticket? Yeah, yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, work within that realm. Driving the Zamboni and mowing the lawn. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Cross pollination, we call this, right? <laughs> Coming from one idea and picking up another idea. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I really like doing is spending time with other people because then I just steal their ideas and put them in my sermons. So it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but you experience others. That. So that's exactly what Paul's doing here. He, he takes from the words of Jesus, from the words of the other apostles, uh, he, uh, through the illumination of the Spirit, he goes to the Old Testament, he goes into his rabbinical background, and then he borrows from Greek philosophy and Stoic thought. So he's a master of that. So basically he says, when you owe the state, now owe nothing but love, true love. What did you say that death is? Uh, the neighbor is, in your notes, it is... Is it in our notes? Yeah, it is. It's love your neighbor. The term neighbor, literally, another of a different kind. So when they say kind, that made me think of that verse that says, you know, you're supposed to stay with your own kind. You're supposed to marry your own kind. Right. So neighbor would be kind of like people outside of your faith. Yes, or outside of your culture, your community. Because when the rich man says, who is my neighbor, Jesus says, who is his neighbor? Well, I'll think of the story, man was walking down the road, got beat up. Samaritan. The Samaritan, right? So the Samaritan was Jesus' illustration of who your neighbor is. And Samaritans were like the bad guys. Like they're the people you don't talk to, the people you, you actually you don't, can't even walk by them without getting them clean. And so when the guy says, who's my neighbor? Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. Uh, there was a guy going down the road, got beat up. And so that's what Paul's talking about, who your neighbor is, that which is outside of yourself. Someone whom you wouldn't normally, maybe the people in the community next door that you don't always agree with. Who is it you guys hated when you were growing up, Donna? Well, we didn't hate them. No. I mean, like Scepter, Burstall. Yeah, those Scepter boys. Those Scepter boys, they were always the worst ones, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. those Scepter boys. And Joyce, where are you from, Burstall? No, no, no. Oh, see, notice, the, look at that. No. <laughs> That's exactly, you know, it's those outside of us. Uh, you know, pr growing up as a Mennonite, you know, like you were, oh, you, were, you shouldn't associate with those people, right? Like, oh, oh, oh. And I suspect many of you, who are you not allowed to associate with, Jody? The ones who wear pants. Yeah, the ones that wore pants. Or don't come to the church, I go to. Yeah, yeah. The people from Morse. People from Morse, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Calgary, Edmonton, yeah. We all have a sense of the other, and that's who you're supposed to use your neighbor. Your neighbor is the other. That, uh, all right, 11 through 13, Fritz. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard there. We continue. So, okay. oh, and now, keep going. And to this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from this slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on an armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the devil. Paul works his way through society and he targets three groups of people. First is the state as represented by the Roman officials, Taxation, government, that, that faceless bureaucracy. You know, the old line that, uh, what is it? Bureaucracy, oh yeah, bureaucracy is the tyranny of democracies. You know, this idea that there's this faceless machine called the state, and whoever is there, the office. The, and the face may change, but the office remains. So you always respect the tax collector, you always respect the mayor, you always, maybe not, you don't appreciate the person, but you, so the sense Paul says, when it comes to the faceless face of bureaucracy, Subjugation. He says, when it comes to the opposite, which is your neighbor, who doesn't have a title at all, but is someone you know by name. So you see the contrast? And we're to treat the same. Give that which is due the faceless state 
and give that which is due the face of your neighbor. And then he moves to society as a whole. And he says, and when it comes to society, so love your neighbor, be subject to the state, but what are you supposed to do in the face of a corrupt society? This is the third category. What does he say right there? Put on the armor of light. Don't get involved in this case. So he kind of takes these three facets of a society. The state, your neighbor, and the broadest terms of a culture and its behaviors, its morals, its practices. He says, one, be subject to. Yes. One, love. The third one, don't get involved which is interesting, but he's addressing every facet of society, and he says, do this. Uh, this can point to what's behind it, that is, love your neighbor and obey the state, but it can also point forward to what's about to come. Do this. What motivates our love and obedience and holiness? Because that's what he's about to talk to. Obey the state, love your neighbor, and be holy. What is to motivate our holiness in this passage? What's that choice? Right, so that's what we're supposed to do. But what's the motivation? Do this knowing the day is near, the second coming. The hour is coming. Do you remember as a kid when your mother said, wait till your father comes home, or your father said, wait till your mother comes home? I'm not sure what household you were in. But I, you know, when we would get in trouble, mom would say, you're sitting here on the couch until dad gets home, because she didn't know how to deal with us. So, but that hour, and you'd watch the clock, and then you'd wait to hear the sound of the car in the driveway, and then dad walk in the driveway. Just like if you poured diesel on a chicken, and, and you knew that sound of your father's footsteps coming through the, uh, sorry, personal story. Um, knowing that the father is returning, we should then therefore live. And that's what Paul says here. Therefore, live. The night is almost gone. The day is near. He's talking about the second coming. Therefore, rid yourself of darkness and put on light. By that, he's talking about moral behavior. And he begins to give a list. Um, interesting. In 13 and 14, he says carousing, drunkenness, promiscuity, debauchery, strife, and jealousy. He gives this long list. Um, this is actually three pairs of two terms. The terms have this what we call semantic overlap. They're words that are familiar to each other. And they could be synonyms. Paul's just, he's, he's, double, <laughs> he's double tapping, tick, 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 making his point, which he does almost poetically. The first one he says is carousing and drunkenness. All right, what does it mean to go carousing in your mind? <laughs> With that, bar hopping? Yeah, good. Oh, we'll get the, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and actually, Shelley, your translation's closer to the authentic. Yeah. Carousing. I want to ask who's gone carousing. I was thinking of like a tomcat at night. You know, they're out carousing. <laughs> that's what a tomcat does. He goes out carousing. Interesting word, carousing. Um, this uh, refers to sexual immorality, which was linked to the pagan rituals to drunkenness. So sexual behavior and drunkenness were linked together. And in this list, the sins of the flesh uh, in Galatians 5.21. Comos was the phrase where we get the phrase carousing from. Comos was a ritualistic drunken procession performed by revelers in ancient Greece whose participants were known as komasts. And that's where we get the word carousing from. Comos was the Greek god of revelry, merrymaking, festivity, and with it, drunkenness. He was the son of the cupbearer of the god Dionysus, and Cosmos was depicted either as a wind youth, like a little youth with feathers or little feet thingies, or a, chi a goat child with a balding pate and a donkey's ears. So imagine this goat child, he's bald, he's got donkey. When we think about donkeys, what do you associate with donkeys? Stubbornness, Stubbornness but also <laughs> carousing behaviors. I have now moved, I'm often very careful about the language and certainly the images I use. There's a little tiny black and white image on your page, which you have there. I'm not going to draw attention to you. You can see what that is. All right. That little man there with the goat beard and the horn, that is Komos. Okay. The procession contained aggressive phallic demonstrations. The men would drop their pants 
at parade their stuff. Thank you, Dan. With the emphasis on breaking sexual norms, uh, pedestrian adultery, and rape. And these young men would go around, buck naked in these processions, drunk, and they would commit great sexual evils. And so it writes this. This is actually a quote from the, the time period. The Katakurazi are repulsive, black, shaggy creatures. They're almost always male, equipped with massive persons. Cosmos, the beggar ritual, ecstasy, dressing up as animals the, with a vulgar emphasis on the sexual sphere, ridicule, fighting, and the personification of the dead are typical of groups like these who perform between Christmas and Epiphany. He is describing an event between Christmas and Epiphany when men would dress up as animals, go out and carouse and rape and commit all kinds of sexual debauchery. So Paul says he is talking about a specific event in culture. He's saying, no longer go party with the boys during Cosmos, because that's not who you are. Behave now as light. So you can imagine these pagans who had, this was without any guilt or shame, this was the norm. This is what you did on holidays. And they become Christians and Paul says, I have to remind you, don't, you can't do that anymore. That's a big stretch. You know, like that's, a, that's conversion. Many of us were raised in Christians' homes. You know, our, our moral values were pretty rigid. Uh, and we're you know, quite shocked by the things we see. But for them, the contrast was so stark between what they came from and what they go to. And this, yeah, this is the mildest that I could find for it. All right. That's the first phrase. And the two were, were linked together. Secondly, sexual promiscuity and sensuality, the pair seems to overlap the first pair. Uh, the second is used extensively in the New Testament. Uh, one is drunkenness, the, pair, the second focuses on sexual morality, even socially uncontrolled abandonment to sensuality. And so Shelley's translation says orgies. And then lastly, strife and jealousy, uh, this conflict, inappropriate conduct between the first two pairs, violence that occurs uh, often. Uh, fornication and violence would go hand in hand together. You can feel the darkness and the, this stew flowing, and I don't want to spend more time there. All right. So what is Paul saying? Because Jesus is coming, it's time for those social practices to end. Are there any social practices that would obviously not replicate what this is, but might in some way parallel to these behaviors? Furries. Parties, yeah. Furries. Oh, furries, yeah, yeah. Sorry, my hearing's off today. Um, fur yeah, that whole furry culture, right? Or uh, bronies, yeah. <laughs> All right, do you know the toy My Pretty Pony that Sherry has, My Pretty Pony? Yeah. You know, men adopted that, dressed up as horses. <laughs> males, males adopted that, dressed up as horses and did what horses do with horses in horse costumes. That's a brony. Yeah, very similar to this. As long as somebody's getting kicked in the head, I'm okay with it. Yeah, maybe kicked a little lower would help too. That's a brony. A bro, a bro pony. I thought it had something to do with baking. A brony, yeah. I like my bronies dark and crunk. Like, that's not going to work out. I was interested and then I wasn't. That first internet search he did really perked his head. Yeah, no, this is not what I This is not what I came to look for. I think there are cultural analogies to this, and even just, you know, the stag party or the stagette, that level of debauchery. Okay, I don't want to spend more time, because scripture does, it just simply says, in light, don't live that way anymore. But instead, and that's the whole thing, because they were putting on costumes, so he says, what should you be putting on? Putting on the armor of light, putting on Jesus. So he uses the language of revelry. This is almost like Mardi Gras, you know? That whole world, he says, put, don't put that on, put on Jesus. And the imagery here is the royal robe of a king, uh, that placed on the shoulders of believers. So we get this contrast images between putting on a, a horse's costume or the debaucher's costume or versus putting on a royal robe. And it's a beautiful analogy, uh, in a sense, the, the Jesus side. <laughs> And therefore, in doing so, now here's the heart of it. And I think this is where we as 21st century Christians can grab all. He says, make no provision for the flesh. The word provision there is pronoia. It, it conveys the basic idea of planning something out ahead of time, giving it forethought, or carrying out thoughtful planning to meet a need. And the idea is to think about something ahead of time. So ladies, retreat is coming up. 
You have made provision. You've been thinking. You've been planning. It's been on your mind. I know it's been con many a conversation in our house. Seating's coming up or whatever. You're working on a project. You're having a baby. You're thinking about things, right? You're making provision for that. It's not like buying stuff. It's making plans ahead of time. And he says here, make no provision for indulging the flesh. Literally, put a stop to thinking about your evil cravings of your physical nature that you might gratify its desires or lusts. So I want you to think about the time you were hungry and you went grocery shopping. <laughs> what happens? Yeah, yeah. You buy a ridiculous... <laughs> yeah, you buy more than that's on the list, right? Because you're thinking about it. Oh, I'm hungry, then we're going to have I'm going to eat that, I'm going to taste that, and oh, that's going to taste good, we're going to mix that. And your whole time, your brain is circulating, thinking, oh, we're going to cook it that way, and then oh, we're going to have this. Your, your brain is making provision for its lusts. And not in a negative sense, but its desires. And he says the same thing with your sexual desires. So you can imagine these people, when it comes to this thing, they are planning for weeks and months ahead for this revelry. They're making provision, planning and dreaming about it. And he says, stop in your mind thinking about what your desires want. But rather, what should we think about? Whatever is beautiful, noble, of good report, all these things. Every time we make provision, um, we plan ahead. You know, no, one, no, one, no one's marriage you know, falls on, in a heartbeat. We, we think about these things ahead of time, right? We, we tend to plan ahead for our, our, our behavior. Is that making sense? And so he says, don't make that, rather think about Jesus, which is kind of sounds cheesy, but um, put on Christ. It's interesting, a survey of discipleship journal, readers ranked the areas of greatest spiritual challenges. The number one was materialism, because we live in a, so what do we do? We think about what we're going to buy. Oh, we're going to get this, and I'm going to buy that, and I'm going to get those shoes, and I'm going to line them, then I'm going to go to Kindersley, and I'm going to go to that store, oh sorry, Bonnie, and I'm going to buy that, you know, and we, we, we think, the, the next one was pride, we all wrestle with pride. Um, and even the, all its twisted natures. Uh, Self-centeredness, thinking about ourselves. Laziness, that's fair. Uh, and then anger and bitterness and sexual lust were an interesting tie. Uh, and then envy, gluttony, and lying. So that's the sins that, that we as 21st century Christians tend to deal with. And is that a fair list? It's pretty inclusive, isn't it? Yeah, I, I suspect every one of us uh, would bear testimony to struggling with those things. All right, uh, we're going to wrap up this section. Um, Dylan, could you give me a glass of water? Thanks. I, uh, basically, what Paul is, uh, A.W. A. Pink rephrased, he said, abstain from everything upon which you cannot ask God's blessing. I like that. If you could say, God, bless this moment. Bless this. Then you go, yeah, this is. But if, if you can't say, you know, God, bless this moment, then you probably should. But my, I know A.W. Pink is a noble, but I went to Hee Haw instead. Uh, on the old show Hee Haw, Doc Campbell was confronted by a patient who said he broke his arm in two places. The doctor replied, well then, stay out of those places. <laughs> Make no provision for those places. All right, that wraps up that chapter. Any thoughts on that? Again, these are pretty clear, right? They're just, all I'm adding is a bit of background and a color. Your, your understanding of it is... is well, we, I mean, we talked about that for a while, but that idea of making provision for the flesh in regards to the lust. Yeah. And I mean, I think the way to put it is that we don't have to Absolutely. You know, without looking, without looking for it, it shows up. Yep. So you can say in your mind, well, I'm not, I'm not actively going and looking right. for them, but, oh, but it shows up. But that's like, you're yep. making a provision. Sure. Right? You're making, you're allowing, you're saying, well, that can stay there because, well, I'm not trying to do something. Yep. Right? Yeah, that's right. I'm not, but it's, it is, it's, it's more, I think it's more than just saying, well, I'm not actively doing something, but it's supposed to be that we're actively trying to not yes. make no provision, make no allowance. Absolutely. And, and then this truck pulls up at the shop and this, in this white truck with red letters and he gets out and he says, you need these pliers. I got in my truck and left when he showed up. When he showed up, the snap-on man comes. <laughs> I wasn't even there. And, yeah. <laughs> One of the things somebody told me, he said, when the flyers come, just throw them out. 
Yeah. Don't let them in your house. Look at the flyer. Then otherwise you say, look, oh, we should get that. Got the Canadian Tire he flyer this week. Yeah. He, does, he goes, you don't have money? No problem. You don't have to pay today. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Or, you, you know, finance. and we get the flyer. We go, oh, this is good. This is good. So he says, just be, before they even get home, just throw them out so you don't read them. You know, the, this is materialism, right? The, how to make provision for the flesh. So, all right. Any other thoughts before that lands? Okay. Chapter 14 and to 15, verse 13 are one big section. So, it thus ends this chapter. When it comes to the state, what are we supposed to do? Be subject. When it comes to our neighbor, what are we supposed to do? Love. Love. When it comes to the perverted culture around us? Don't do it. Don't, don't make provision for it. So he addresses those three facets of the world around us. The invisible state, the visible neighbor, and the invisible temptations, which actually are visible in the culture. Obey. Love. Reject. Okay, then he moves on to this curious question. And it's almost like a whole new section starts. Jewish law addressed what issues? Think of all the issues. What did it address? What they ate. What they wore. What they could touch. Yes. How far they could walk on a day. Good. What they could do on what days. It addressed how long your hair should be, what your beard should look like. It addressed the fabric you had in your material. It addressed what, where you drank, who you walked with, how far you walked, how what you farmed. did, how you farmed, what you did, and what you didn't do. There was the minutia of that, like Joni said, we didn't go with those people that wore pants. Um, <laughs> the minutia of that was incredible, and the law, whether the Express 613 laws or the extraction and the extrapolation around it addressed every issue of life. There was not a single, from music to hair to clothes to your friends to the games you played to the food you ate, everything came under the law. Is that easy or hard? It's hard. Why is it hard? Because well, I don't want to and I'll probably forget something at some point. Right. You feel very controlled, yes. So some people that might be simpler, good, I know, I know. That's right, for some people it's very safe. If you can follow the rules, it makes it simple. What advantages are there for a culture when there are laws like that? Very controlling. Sylvia? Everybody feels safe? Order. Order. Unity. Conformity. We all wear the same. We act the same. We know who's in. We know who's out. We know how to punish someone. The law says you do this, you got to do this, and back and forth. Right? So this system has great advantages. Social pressure, conformity. It keeps people's society safe. Uh, it creates continuity, consistency. It creates punishment. All right, then along comes Jesus and says, you're free. Paul says to them, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. You're going, wait a minute, eating and drinking, I understand. Those are nice, clear. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. So I have to be led by the spirit into what gives joy, what is righteous. But I, so the law doesn't define righteousness. The spirit does now. And peace. And, um, and what did people do? They didn't know what to do. If you were raised in a very strict home, and you left home, and now had no governance whatsoever, and had a working wage or a living wage, what is the risk? You can get in a lot of trouble in a big... We call it the rubber band effect. Your parents and your culture held you here, then someone goes, cut, and what do we do? Woo we end up way over there, right? Not all of us, but some of us go a little crazy. Um, I had a friend who uh, was playing hockey, and he was with a Russian fella who had, you know, grown up in Soviet Russia, poor as dirt, got to Vancouver, got his contract from the Canucks, got his bonus from the Canucks, his signing bonus, went to the bank and cashed his signing bonus, <laughs> took his bag of money, and went shopping. And the fella said it was the craziest day he'd ever had. This guy who had nothing had a bag of money and was just buying everything. He bought everybody something, right? Absolutely crazy. This is the most wonderful, it was the most entertaining day he'd spent years. Uh, 
So you can imagine living in poverty and restraint and, and want, and then having in Western culture in downtown Vancouver you could shop. You can see where the reaction is, and that's what's happening. They're under the law with all its restrictions, and they are told now to, you're free. But the Gentiles, what were they? They were the opposite. They had no law. They had no moral compass. They were used to this cosmos guy. Um, and they're being told to restrain themselves. Now put on light. Live holy. And they're, and they're chafing under this, going, well, what do I do? What do I do? What am I allowed? What, am I still allowed to? I'm free. Should I still go to the cosmos? Per cosmos sounds like a Russian celebration, but to the cosmos parade. Hey, yeah. You know, what should I do? And they were given freedom. Freedom from guilt or freedom from shame. Or, and this whole section now, in 14 to 53, addresses freedom. Which would you rather do? Drive in an open Walmart parking lot or on the highway? Highway. Why, Harlan? It's crowded. It's too crowded? Good. An empty parking lot? No, there was lots of other cars. <laughs> Typical Saturday afternoon. On the highway. Because there's law. Everybody knows their place. You pass, you go, here's the line door. What's the rule of Walmart parking lot? There are no, it's anarchy, right? It's whoever has the biggest truck. It's fight club. Yeah, it's fight club and vehicles, right? Whoever has the biggest, you know, that, uh, it's chaos. It's freedom. You can drive wherever you want. You could park sort of, uh, there are lines, but if you have a Mercedes, you don't park on the line, right? You go park where you want. That's the issue. All right. The perils of freedom. You said poor is poorer than dirt. Have you tried to buy dirt lately? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding, eh? It's like cheaper than... That doesn't work anymore. Cheaper than sugar. No, it's not, yeah. All right. Bertrand Russell said this, Freedom in general may be defined as the absence of obstacles to the realization of desires. That's the secular definition of freedom. In other words, whatever obstacle is in the way so that I can have my desires are met, if that obstacle's gone, I'm free. I am free to do whatever I desire. That's how it... What's another definition of freedom? What are your definitions of freedom? Now we're back in the book. Well, when I, lots of people ask me what, what made you come here, and I would often say freedom because it felt so controlled and being yeah. told what to do all the time, being watched and being shamed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, freedom means that the locus of control or the center of control is internal. I can make the decisions, I have the control over my behavior. Without all those external constraints. Good. Donna, you should start singing, freedom, freedom. Sorry, White Christmas, Bing Crosby. Free to live, freedom. The holiday, thank you. All right, anybody else? What's your definition of freedom? Retirement. Retirement. I read a very interesting article on the track of happiness. Um, up to 20 People are sort of not happy. They're okay. They're kind of the, then from 20 to 45 is the least happy time of people's lives. It is actually the lowest level of happiness. But when you look back on it as a retired person, yeah. oh, but that was such a good life. It was good, yeah. You know, even though I didn't have freedom, but it was good. It was golden. It was, oh, absolutely. We've talked about that many times. The happiest people are people over 50. Because they've achieved some level of comfort, some level of success. And the older people get, the happier they get. So Shelley's comment on retirement, we actually know that the older people get, the happier they are. And it's curious, eh? Because you know, you've, you've achieved something or a sense of maybe some stability, um, despite all the pain. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always issues, but they... Uh, yeah, it was a curious article. So, so, sorry for this table and a chunk of this table. You're at the un least, uh, least happy time of your life. Yay! <laughs> this table, happy days! <laughs> that's an interesting thing because that's, I certainly didn't find that. That you got happy as you got older? Yeah, I found that back when I was these guys' age was my happiest time. Oh, you're in a bit of an anomaly. You know. yeah. No, it's just, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's good. That's what I'm saying. I'm happy with you. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Okay, so this guy's wrong. He isn't like how old is this guy who wrote that? A bunch of twenty year olds, what do they know? Yeah. All right, well we're gonna that's not in my notes, I just threw that out there.
All right. Uh, Golly Gribben, in his article, The Madman, writes, oh, it's actually a book. Um, I have found both freedom and safety in my madness, the freedom of loneliness and the safety from being understood. I love that. Someone who's mad, um, he's free from loneliness because he's crazy. Like, you know, the, the birds are talking to him. And he says, the safety from being understood. Uh, I, I don't have to worry about people understanding me. I'm safe. People don't, no one understands me, so I'm safe in my madness. So maybe there's a certain freedom in madness. Um, and Martin Luther said, a Christian man is the most free, Lord of all, subject to none. The Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all, subject to all. The question that arose as I was thinking about this is, does education make you free? I say yes and no. Okay, that's good. Sylvia, why? Uh, for me, yes is because I, I've learned enough and I can make my own decisions. Yeah. Based on what I That's a very wise answer, yes. I think that kind of sums up the, the argument that we're about to present. And that is um, knowing scripture, knowing the spirit, knowledge, which is a form of education, uh, is absolutely liberating, but it also gives more responsibility because now you're responsible for what you know. All right. Freedom is one of the great central themes of the New Testament. 133 times in scripture. We're not going to read all these verses. They are there. Uh, but these are the great freedom verses. I'll just get Danny to read John 8, uh, 31 and 32, and Joyce 8, 36. So what is Jesus' message to humanity? I have said you, you can be free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free uh, those who are downtrodden and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, right? Freedom from disease, freedom from oppression, freedom from chains, freedom, all these things. Jesus says, I am basically here to set you free. Great message. That's also the message of Moses, right? Moses said, I'm here to let my people go. And off they went. So Jesus is, Moses is a, a type of Jesus. All right, within Romans then, this theme keeps getting repeated. Romans 6, 7, for the one who has died is freed from sin. Romans 6, 18, after being freed from sin. Romans 6, 20, free in relationship to righteousness when you were slaves of sin. The opposite there. 6, 22, but now being freed from sin. Uh, if her husband died, she is free from the law. All right, why is freedom such a central issue in Romans? Think about the culture. Because of all the slaves. Absolutely. Here's a culture that the expression slave and free is not a metaphor. It's a reality. There were Romans, there were free men, and there were slaves. Three categories of society, right? So Roman citizens had all the benefits of citizenship. Free people weren't slaves, but they weren't Romans. And then, of course, the entire massive bulk of society that did the work. Who were the, who were the free they were people who weren't citizens. They didn't, hadn't achieved citizenship yet. So let's say you were an Egyptian, okay. but you weren't a slave. In the empire, you were a free person. Okay. But you didn't have the rights and the privileges of citizenship. Yeah. So they'd be almost like in Canada, like a, like a landed immigrant or someone here on a work visa. So in this culture, Paul says, you will be free. And who's he talking to? Slaves, in many cases. So the question then rises, what do you do with freedom? Of course, there's the next page on six. You will see, or my page numbers are different than yours. All right. Let me give you a few guiding thoughts. I want to be careful, aware of the time. It's 20 after. As we move into this section on freedom, because this is a major section coming up. First off, this cultural context of the Jews who were legalistic, being used to being under the bonds, the Gentiles who were used to nothing but freedom or strived for freedom, and within that, the slavery-free people, all this sets the cultural context for it. Um, believers must be careful not to make a theology or ethics 
the standard, we're going to see that coming up, that how we use our freedom cannot be applied to everyone. Uh, all believers must walk in the light they have, but understand their theology is not automatically God's theology. When I grew up, we were not allowed to go to the movies because that was sinful, right? That was pagan. So my parents' theology was not God's theology, or we were allowed to... We, on Sunday after church, we couldn't change out of our church clothes. We had to stay in our church clothes all day, uh, which is hard when you're nine. Uh, <laughs> and we went through a lot of church clothes. I think about it. So their, their theology, I don't think it was biblical, but they held dearly to that and lived by that. I still can't join, get Joni to stay in her nice church clothes all day on Sunday. Get home, I gotta get my pants. Yeah, exactly. Just rub down, don't just uh, cause, because that's how you're raised, right? Sunday you gotta stay in your church clothes. We weren't allowed to play games on Sunday. Oh, it's terrible. All right. Um, one's attitude and motives before God are the real keys. These are all the summary. I'm giving you the summary ahead of time. Uh, the keys in evaluating other believers' actions. Christians will stand before Christ. We'll get there. Uh, other places. Um, this section uses two words, strong and weak. And we have a prejudicial, we kind of think, when you think of someone who's strong, what do you think of? Muscular. Muscular, good. Someone who's strong in their faith. Consistent. Consistent. Good. Able, to endure. able to endure, yeah, virtuous, right? All the good things. And weak would be the opposite. We don't want such so, but and so we tend to have negative, but Paul doesn't use them in that in that context. He's going to redefine strong and weak. So when you hear the word strong and weak, don't let your imagination uh, or your ideas get the best of you. Uh, and here's the entire argument. Accept one another because God accepts us in Christ. Don't judge one another as Christ. Love is more important than freedom and follow Christ. All right, we're going to get ahead. I think we're going to stop because I don't want to jump into this section uh, because if I start now, it's going to stop part way and then you're going to forget and then it's not going to be good. Does that make sense? All right. Well, there you go. You can head off to 10-4 now for ice cream. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's called salt in the wound. Burn, man, burn.